Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Affiliate Summit webinar, Content is Key, How to Use Content to Drive Traffic, Increase Revenue, and Boost Search. Sorry about that, my, my little uh, board there was covering up my slide. So I'm going to go over a little bit of Affiliate Summit information for you before we get started. First of all, thank you for all joining us today. I'll send you a 10% discount to Affiliate Summit East 2012 for joining us today. And if that just doesn't cut it for you and you like a free networking pass to Affiliate Summit East, then please write down the bit that link you see on bullet number four so that you can try to get a free pass to Affiliate Summit East 2012. Well, it's, there's really no trying in it. All you have to do is take a picture of yourself with a flat Missy or a flat Sean, check in on Foursquare at one of your favorite places, and send a link to realdeal at affiliatesummit.com for that check-in, and automatically you get a free networking pass to Affiliate Summit East 2012. So no more excuses. I hope to see you there. Affiliate Summit East is taking place August 12th through the 14th in New York City, as well as we have an Affiliate Summit Central this year coming up in May 15th through the 16th in Austin, Texas. Now this is a smaller event and we only have about 350 participants um, in this event and we are getting close to full on registration. So if you'd like to come to Affiliate Summit in Austin, Texas, have more opportunities for networking, cheaper prices, then I would go ahead and register today. Also, if anybody would like to um, host an Affiliate Summit webinar, then please contact me at maryp at affiliatesummit.com. If you'd like to tweet about this webinar, please do so at hashtag AppSumWebinar. Okay, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Lisa Piccarilli. Lisa is an online content strategist who focuses on online marketing, branding, and social media. She is the co-founder of MyContentPro.com. Lisa teaches internet marketing classes for USF Online. She also co-hosts the popular Affiliate Thing podcast with Affiliate Summit co-founder Sean Collins. She happens to be a veteran journalist who began her career as a professional sports writer in Boston and has headed the news department of major high-tech news organizations including Wired.com, TechWeb.com, TechTV.com, and CRN.com. Her work has also appeared in Rolling Stone, CRM Magazine, PC Week, Mac Week, Computer World, and Info World. So I hope you all get a lot of information out of this webinar. She is a content, content queen. So let's pass this on over to Lisa Piccarilli and thank you so much for hosting this webinar for us, Lisa. Um, I also want to note I am recording this and I will be sending the email out with your 10% discount and a link to the recorded version. So don't worry about trying to scribble down all those notes. So here we go, Lisa. It's all ready for you. Well, hello. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you, Mary. Um, and I just want to say that Mary is right. you got to all sign up for Affiliate Summit, whether it's both of them, the Central or East. I never miss them, and it's always a great opportunity. So I'm here today to talk to you about content and why content is so important. I think we all hear over and over that, you know, content is king. It takes a lot of work to create content, and people think, you know, I don't have time to write an article or a blog or, you know, all these things that entail a lot of time. But the thing is that content is everything that people see on your site. It's not just articles and blogs. It can be podcasts. It can be videos that you take from somewhere else, use and add comments to or make your, uh, your own videos. It can be user-generated content that you gather. It can be reviews of products and services, polls, quizzes, contests, giveaway, it could be news, market research, an ebook, everything that you put up that your you audience sees on your website is content. And so if you start thinking of it that way, you'll be able to make it easier for yourself to create it on a regular basis and put up content more frequently. And that's an important thing. Because content can do a lot for you. It can drive traffic to your site, create sales and revenue for your merchants. It's really a pre-sale tool for them. It can help you do some branding, build your personal credibility, your site's credibility. It can help you get links from other sites, um, you know, get higher rankings in natural search, decrease your paid search traffic, 
costs, uh, attract long tail traffic, word of mouth traffic, and be a source of direct revenue for you. Most of what we talked about above the direct revenue is all kind of indirect revenue that comes to your site. You know, inevitably, you drive traffic to your site, you convert that person to a sale, you're an affiliate, you get a commission. So that's an indirect revenue, but it can also be a source of direct revenue, and we're going to get to that. So it's not you know, the old days of if you just make a site, people will come. You have to have good content. It needs to be compelling and engaging and appealing to people because people love content, but almost as importantly, search engines love content. And search engines index on all these factors and these complicated algorithms that Google goes through and they're not looking for duplicated content so they don't want you to scrape content from somebody else and put it on your site that's not going to help you what you need is original content that is um, engaging to your audience and then the more that you have that type of content the more people you're going to attract the more those people will probably share it and inevitably the higher you're going to get ranked in the search engines so what you want to do is we all know that there are certain keywords depending on your site that work for you and you want to use those keywords and you want to use relevant keywords and titles it's it's great to have some kind of like really clever title, but only do it if it works and sort of uses your keywords. Don't just be clever for clever's sake because sometimes that doesn't work and it's not really telling the search engines what this is about or telling the reader what it's about. And you want to have multiple keywords in your copy, but I'm a big fan of the fact that if copy is well written and well done, you don't have to sort of stuff it with keywords. They'll come naturally. If you have a site, an affiliate site, and you're reviewing luggage or um, you know writing blog posts about the best bags or luggage to get through TSA or whatever, you don't have to stuff it with keywords. That should just come out naturally. Um, of course, you want to go over your copy and make sure that you're getting some in there, but overusing them, I think just makes it really hard for the readers to absorb it and it seems unnatural and I think nobody wants to read things that don't seem natural or authentic and you want to be sure to add tags and categories to everything that you post whether it's an infographic that you put up or a podcast or um, just an image or anything you want to have categories, you want to have keywords associated with those, those are all going to help drive traffic to your site. So the other thing is that the content is really a pre-sale tool for you to drive traffic to your merchant site and you want to increase the conversion so that you get more commissions. So when you're looking at your content, think of it as a pre-sale tool and Think of how the consumer is going to approach it. Put yourself in the consumer's shoes and, and think about what they would want to see. So it's not just about getting the merchant's message across as a pre-sale tool. You don't want to just you know have a product name and pricing and buy this and, and that kind of stuff. You also want to have things like you want to think if I was coming here and I was looking for this and I landed on this page, you know, again I'll go back to the luggage example. What would I want to see? Would I want to see a review? Would I want to see comparisons of other luggage? Would I want to know more descriptors of why this is going to help me get through um, the TSA uh, screenings faster? Would I want to talk about the weight so that I might not have to pay baggage fees? Those are probably all important things to me as a consumer, which means they should be important to you as a content creator in making sure the consumer is getting what they want. The consumer might want to also see reviews of, of these um, pieces of luggage, what other users who bought them might have to say. So it, the more you can add value, the more you differentiate yourself, the better it is for you, for your merchant, and for the user to get what they want. 
So I already sort of went over this example, but you know, often I go to a site and I try to think, you know, like what is compelling about this? And I'm looking for a brand new carry-on bag, and I type in, you know, carry-on luggage with wheels or something, and I go to a website and I get a picture of um, the, maybe I'm looking for a specific brand, and I get this brand and I see a picture of it, and it looks nice, and there's, you know, a link that says like you can buy this now. Well, like I said before, I want to know things about the bag. So if you don't have the content and you don't have other things that are compelling to me, I have the option in one click to just move away from you. So you're not going to drive traffic to the merchant site unless you present something compelling. <coughs> Excuse me. So Content is also going to help you get higher natural search rankings. And Google really favors unique, original content. They don't want you to scrape content or have no content. So Google likes it to be consistently updated and unique. So if you want to rank high in Google, you need to have that kind of content. And the thing about ranking high, I think all of you all know this, as um, as marketers and as people who do searches, if you don't find something generally on the first page or even second page, I rarely even go to the second page, you're not going to click on it. So unless people can rank pretty high for things, um, buyers are going to go elsewhere. So you need to sort of make sure that your content and your results are coming up high and the way that you do that is by having great content and also when people get to the page what you said was going to be there needs to be there. So you can decrease your paid search costs by having quality content that helps people find you in natural search and it also means having a good landing page. This gets you a great you know, reputation with Google, and I think, you know, you don't want to only depend on Google, but the search engines are a really important part of getting traffic to your site. But it's not just about the article you wrote today and how many people come today or how many people came yesterday. It's also about what they call the long tail traffic, and a lot of you you know about this, but it's a concept that Chris Anderson from Wired um, came up with in an article for Wired and eventually wrote a whole book about it. But it is really about things that have value sort of down the road, if you think of it that way. And it's not just ranking high for keywords like digital camera. That'll get people there to you today. Um, but if you have long tail key phrases like Canon PowerShot 80 review or Canon PowerShot 180 best deal or you know a location in there or Canon PowerShot 180 um, uh, coupon or San Francisco or something like that, you're going to get a lot of traffic down the road when somebody's looking for something. So you might have posted a review today, but six months from now, people will still be looking for that. And also, those are valuable people because if somebody is typing in Canon PowerShot 180 review San Francisco, chances are they live in San Francisco, they're looking for where to buy it, and they want to buy it now. So um, that's that's much more targeted traffic, so that's very valuable to you. So we've talked all about you know, why content is important and how it can be sort of an indirect source of revenue, and I think people like to think of that as sort of their main source, but you can take your content and also make it a direct source of revenue to you. So what you can do is you could package your content into an ebook. So you could find blog posts or articles, rewrite them, group them together, um, and create a guide or an ebook or something that you can sell directly on your site. Like find out, you know, for 99 cents, get an ebook of all the best uh, carry on bags. Or you could offer it for free to people, but if you want to make it an 
a, a direct source of revenue, you'd probably have to sell it at something. You can create a paid membership site. You can have some free content, but you can create other content that people have to pay a monthly, weekly, yearly subscription for, and this can offer more in-depth content, um, more reviews, more informative information, more educational information, whatever your topic matter is, and people will pay to become a member. You can also syndicate your stuff for free to other media outlets, but there are media outlets that will pay to syndicate your content. It's um, you probably have to have a pretty uh, some pretty good traffic, be pretty visible, a pretty big name, but they will take your stuff on a regular basis and either do some kind of rev share with you or pay you directly for using that content. And the other thing is you can also aggregate your content into an actual physical book. There are services like Blurb and things like that will, that will let you make a book out of content that you can actually sell. Hey, Lisa. So, yeah. Hey, um, we have a question here that says, with regard to video content, do you recommend using video that already exists or creating original, unique video? I think you can do both. I think what you can do is you can create original unique video but you can also do things like um, use a curation tool like platform like shares.com and aggregate videos and then comment on those videos and then that your commentary and um, sort of the context that you put the video in then becomes unique content so I think you can do both ooh that's awesome I like that thank you so all of this is great if you, you know, create all this great stuff, but the thing is that you've got to factor social media into this. So, you know, if you have a blog and you're driving decent traffic, but you want to drive more and you, you have to have multiple ways to distribute things. So you want to make sure that you put any posts that you write or links to posts you write on your Facebook fan page or your company Facebook page. You want to use Twitter to drive people, whether it, it, depending on what you want. If you want them to go to your fan page, you can use Twitter to drive them there. But if you want them to read the content on your website, because the chances are they may actually make the click and buy from a merchant, then you know include a short a link shortener and um, put something up on Twitter to drive people to your post. Probably try to make it less marketing-y, like oh, you know, buy this great bag, but instead like, hey, check out this bag I found that lets you breeze through airport security and then put a link to it or something. You, want, you can also post your content on forums such as the Affiliate Summit. If you have something to say that um, you want to get engaged in conversations, then I recommend joining these forums and Affiliate Summit is a great one and you can get into the conversation and then include a link as well but really in those environments you want to not be spammy and not push people but just say hey I think you might enjoy reading this if it's about something that's pertinent to that particular thread. I mean that's the thing is you want to have a context and make it relevant for people. The same thing with LinkedIn. There are plenty of groups on LinkedIn. If you have specialized niche sites or whatever you focus on, you probably have joined some groups on LinkedIn and they would probably appreciate seeing what you have to say on particular topics. So, you know, that's a great driver as well. And the thing, you know, everybody is talking about Pinterest and a couple of weeks ago, Trisha Meyer did this fantastic presentation um, here, a webinar on uh, the Affiliate Summit webinar about Pinterest. and. Everybody is trying to figure out how to make money with it, but you can have a Pinterest account, post some images that you've associated with your content to drive content to drive people back to your website. So I, I think that when they get there, if you have compelling content, you're probably going to keep them coming back. And that's the whole thing is you want people to return because you have compelling content. So you might be saying like, well, all this is great, but you know, I don't have the time or the money to hire people to do all this stuff. And the thing is, content isn't that hard to create. I mean, you can go on services like Elance. Um, 
you can go on uh, Craigslist or Fiverr or all these places and hire people. You're going to have to sort of vet people to see if what they're doing is appropriate for you and um, determine if the, the level of writing is up to sort of what you want. But you can also do it yourself or spread it throughout. If you have multiple people working for you, capitalize on their expertise. And so the way that you can get tons of ideas is, you know, just listen to the market, be active in forums, um, attend trade shows, make sure that you're reading all the other blogs and market research on topics, listen to podcasts about topics, read comments that are in other stories. And also, if you're an affiliate, you can look to your merchant to see if they have information that they want to share with you that might be relevant to your audience. There are so many places that will you can come up with ideas and it's important to sort of have a list, keep a running list of ideas and you know I, I think if, if you create, um, the next thing I was going to say is consistency is the key and you want to set expectations. So one of the things that I really recommend is making a schedule for content. So it, you can know that on Monday you're posting, if you have a very general site, maybe, uh, and again I'll go back to the luggage thing, but if you have a site that talks about, uh, that's trying to put to do sell luggage and you have a lot of different merchants maybe Monday is um, focused on reviews maybe Tuesday is focused on travel destinations and packing for those destinations maybe Wednesday is focused on reader comments maybe Thursday is uh, a podcast uh, about a particular issue that's relevant. Maybe you have a guest blog on Friday, but if you make a schedule, it makes it so much easier because instead of having this wide open, um, you know, blank blank screen where you're thinking, what am I going to post today? Instead, it's like, oh well, I know I have to post. Um, something about packing today or something that makes packing easier or I know that I have to have a guest blog for Thursday. So it makes it much easier for you to do it and for me the most important thing is sticking to it and the, the reason I say that is think about it if you're a reader and you know we'll go way back to the old days of having a newspaper you know, on Mondays it was Science Monday or Travel Tuesday or whatever. At food, the food section maybe came out on Wednesday or Thursday. If I got the newspaper and there was no food section, or even now when I go online, I know in my local um, online newspaper, Wednesday is food day. But if they didn't have the food section updated on Wednesday, I would be angry with them. I would think you set my expectations and now you took something away from me. And the thing is you always want to be giving people things. You don't want to take things away from them. Even if what you're giving them is free, when you take it away, it, it makes people angry. And it also makes them um, less trusting of you and it probably makes them perhaps not come back the next time because they're thinking, oh, well, last week you didn't even have your stuff up on in the food section, so why should I go there? I'll find somewhere else that is consistent. So it really is important to be consistent, set expectations, and then exceed them. And I think for me, one of the really big things is to also just make sure that you're putting your own original tone and spin on things and everything you know should be coming from your perspective and you will be able to build an audience and create trust with them and creating that trust is the key to having people come back it's the key to attracting new people you know, when people like you, they share things with other folks and then those people come in and embrace you and when all that happens, that increases your traffic, that increases your rankings, and that probably increases the commissions that you're making. So um, I could probably go on and on forever about this, but I want to see if you guys have questions because I want to know what you want and I want to specifically answer your questions. So I think you can either type them in and Mary will help me out with that or I, I guess you can 
raise your hand virtually and ask me a question. <laughs> That's right. There is a, a way for you guys to raise your hand, but if you, um, and that way I can unmute you, so that way you can ask your question, or you can write it in the questions pane, so. So I know someone must have a question. Do we have a very quiet group today? I know. It's like I can't possibly have covered everything, so people must have something that, uh, that they want to ask. Okay. Um, <laughs> as usual, Lisa, you're doing a great job. That's a question. <laughs> no, that's a statement. And then... I think that's questionable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> That's funny. Um, how long does a video take to rank? You know, um, I've heard different. I've heard different things. So um, I've heard of things, you know, ranking really quickly, and then I've heard of things that also take like three days to rank. So um, I'm I'm not really sure, and I and I have to say I'm not an expert enough in video to know the specifics about that, but I do know that um, all the market research I see says that video consumption just continues to rise and exceed, you know, I think more, there's something like more people watch, more people watch videos on the, watch video on the internet than they do all the um, network channels combined. Wow. Yeah, videos are so, great. Um, so even if it takes you a couple days to get that ranked, that's probably still a good thing. Yeah. Um, another question you have is, what are some of the tricks for getting past some of the panda changes we've seen recently, especially as they apply to affiliates? Oh, God. I, I think some of the tricks are that you have to have content that is not scraped, that is not seen as duplicate, that is seen as unique, that is seen as... Um, creating user value and then I think you know there probably are some specific search things that need to go into that as well I will tell you that I have a client who was hit pretty hard by the panda stuff back in April and I've been working with him since then and I don't think they're fully recovered and they have also worked with a search uh, uh, an SEO expert as well, and I think it's a combination of things. It's sort of the right amount of content, um, using the right keywords, seeing when the next updates are coming, making sure that all the other SEO um, things that Google requires you to be in line with are that you're doing those correctly. Also making sure that you don't have, some people I know have found that they had certain flags or penalties against them that they claim they were unaware of. So sort of, you know, I guess it's like your credit history. You better make sure you know what's in there and, um, and take care of things that are that are impacting that and I think there can be notifications that you might not even know about but the best thing is just to have content that is unique and not duplicated and offers value so when people go to a search engine result and it says I'm gonna get a review of this to me roller bag this model when I get there, I want to see a review. And if Google sees that you don't have the review there and I have to click three more times, that's, they're not going to be happy about that. And neither will your um, readers. Very good. Um, can you have too much content on your site? If so, how do you know how to pare down your content and create the optimal amount? Yeah, I was going to say you can have too much content. Um, I mean, I, I think you have to expect that people aren't going to just sit there and read and read and read. But again, what you want to do is give people um, what they expect to get and perspective. So I might not want to read a 1,000 word article uh, reviewing a particular roller bag, but a short review of it and then maybe a link that says read other reviews of this or read reviews of similar bags. So I don't want the whole page 
age to look overwhelming to me. And I also want to make sure that whatever the action I want people to take is clear. So I don't want them to have to read and read and read and keep going down you know, paging down before it says, you know, buy this bag or read other reviews. I want that stuff to be accessible enough to them that I I can get them to take action before I lose them from being tired of all the content. <laughs> well, then, um, to that point, is it better to set the blog to display only one post at a time, or should they show two, three, or more art articles on a page? I would say that I like, I like sites where if you have a blog, you have the most recent one showing, but you maybe have an excerpt of it, and you can determine based on your site. Um, how big that's going to be, but I think people like to come and see something new. So if you're posting consistently and you're doing it with a blog, you know, put you know maybe two paragraphs of it and say read more or you know um, other popular blog posts. You can have that in some sort of navigation right there as well. But I wouldn't just have like a running list of like all my blog posts. I think I would highlight the most recent one and and then let people uh, an excerpt of that and then let people click through okay well then to that what would you say would be the um, optimal amount of blog posts or articles to do um, say in a week I think that depends I mean some topics have a lot more to say than others and it depends are you using your blog just to talk about issues and then do you have another part of the site that focuses on you know product reviews or do you review products in the blog is the blog is the blog your website I mean that's the whole thing it's it, it's different some people use a blog as a component of an overall website some people use the blog as the website so I think it's different right um, but I would say that if you post if you post a minimum of two times a week that's okay but and if you if you feel that you need to post every day that's fine as well but I do think that consistency is the key so don't post every day for two weeks and then not post for two weeks um, someone has said, I'm noticing more and more that websites have posts that are very short, even as short as 100 words. How can this rank? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm almost laughing at that. Um, you know, honestly, I don't know how that can rank, because to me, that's that's barely a post. That's like, you know, a, a blurb description of something. Um, but I guess that those things do rank, but I do question as a consumer and as a producer of content what the value of that is. And I, I am not sure about Google's specific expectations in terms of length if there's a minimum. I know that for an average blog post, I think between 400 to 600 words is is enough to get into something, but I would never go shorter than a hundred words. Unless you have an element that goes with it that's visual. So you can write a hundred words if you have an infographic, maybe you're describing the infographic or maybe you're commenting on a video, but I would never go shorter than that and expect it to be like a standalone post. Right. Um... Well, there's another question here that says, for example, Mashable.com, they have a lot of short posts, but they rank very high. Oh, okay, that, that's the same person. It's a follow-up to that question. Well, Mashable, I mean, the other thing is Mashable ranks really high because it ha right now because it has a huge amount of traffic. Um, so people are already going there, and, and it's, it's a really known quantity and oftentimes they're the first to write about a particular topic so I, I mean I'm not saying you can't write short things I think I think you can but I just I don't know where the reader value is they're more of I think it's different for them because if you're doing a site that's that's an affiliate site that's intending to um, promote luggage or pet supplies or cooking you know, or cooking supplies or something like that, 
you're not a news organization, so Mashable is often putting stump, something up because they want to be first, they want to be quick, and you know it's important for them to just get it up, and they don't even have all the information at that point. So I think it's a whole different thing if you're kind of a quasi news site. Exactly. Okay. Uh, what is your favorite trick to bring life to a boring topic? Um, just to think about it in a new way. Like, you know, I think I would ask this person, like, what's a boring topic? You know, I think that you could think everything's boring, but Malcolm Gladwell managed to several years ago write like 3,000 words in the New Yorker about mustard. I don't even <laughs> like mustard, and it was riveting. You know, I mean, I, I have, I, I think what be, what is not boring, but what becomes tedious is if you have a site where there's something that essentially there's only one focus. So I always tell people to like look at calendars, look at different things and think like even if you're a pet site and this week was National Peanut Butter Week, you might think, well, how does that apply to me? Well, maybe you review the best peanut butter dog snacks or why peanut butter is good for dogs. If you're a, a, a health and fitness site, maybe you talk about protein bars that contain peanuts or why almonds are a superfood or you know why nuts are a superfood whatever you can always find something okay let's say that your thing is you know data backup or whatever well, your whole purpose is really your message you're communicating to people is you need to back up um, you know there if you don't back up there are consequences and yes there are things that you can write about related to that but it's kind of like only one theme so those kinds of things get a little tougher after probably several months like what am I gonna come up with now that isn't just saying hey don't forget to back up it's important um, but I think if you have a review sites or you're selling a variety of different products it's I don't know I think it's never boring okay and what do you think is the optimal number of times my keywords should be in a 400 word article <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it depends what your keynote, what your keywords are. If they're like awkward keywords, like I, I, I mean, I'm, I suppose no keywords should be awkward. But if it just feels forced, I, I mean, think about this: write it out, put it in as many times as you want before you post it, and then read it out loud to yourself, like print it out or something or sit there and read it on your screen and when you say it out loud the repetitiveness of it to you you'll understand when it's too much um, I, I really I, I think that's the only way you can do it because when you write it you think okay well that seems okay and that and as soon as you write it down and you say I just said the word luggage or carry on or whatever 18 times you're like wow that's way too much right but it, um, have you ever heard of like if you're you know writing an article I've heard before that it's best to have your keyword at least three times once in the beginning and once in the middle and once near the end oh yeah I mean I, but don't you think that that should come naturally if you're writing about if you're if you're writing about it and I I'm just trying to be consistent so I keep going back to this luggage thing I have no luggage sites not, not <laughs> luggage. in any way um, maybe I'm thinking about going on a trip but you know <laughs> would not you think that if I'm doing a review I would say like this piece of luggage is great for a short trip because of this and the reason I like this bag or I, I mean I would think that they would come up naturally right so I think they're gonna appear three four and five times okay good um, and let's see does having any uh, oh so it, it went up hold on one second does having and or displaying affiliate products that I promote derank my site I don't think it does but I think that you need to make a disclosure whether you have it um, some people people do it differently. People do it with each link. People do it in the middle of a post. People do it on a disclosure page. But I think that if people trust you, and um, and you have been you're honest about the disclosure and that you're going to make money off this, then I, I I don't think that there's anything that 
should keep you from ranking and I don't think there's anything with Google that's keeping you from getting a lower ranking by having the affiliate links. Great. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? I don't have any other questions coming into the question pane. No hands are raised, Lisa, so I'll let you close okay, it. Okay, well, I just want to thank everyone um, for coming, and um, I hope that this helped, and if anybody has any other questions, they can follow up with me directly. My information is on the last screen, and um, I want to thank Affiliate Summit, so that's it. Thank you very much. Um, Lisa, can you show us your last screen real quick? I don't think we've seen it. I I know. I guess I never got – I think I am not the presenter, so that is why I cannot do it. Oh, oh there, there it is. Go. Okay, I'll just leave it on there for just a couple of um, – just a minute or so and then I will I will close it down you're getting a lot of great remarks that people can't wait to see this video on YouTube great data thank you so much Lisa so I'm gonna leave it on for just a minute so you guys can write down Lisa's information and then I will stop the recording I'll send you an email and I'll copy Lisa in the email so that if you do have any questions you can um, you can reply to her thank you again Lisa what a great webinar thank you